Washington Journal continues. We're joined by Congressman Brad Sherman, Democrat from California's 27th Congressional District, a member of the House Financial Services Committee. Good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Good to be with you, Steve. Let's talk about some of the issues in the lame duck session. First of all, the Bush era tax cuts. The president saying, let's keep taxes for middle class at the current level. Republicans are saying, keep taxes low across all economic uh, social lines. What's going to happen? Well, the one thing nobody's talking about, including the president, is the Obama tax cuts. Uh, taxes, if we implement the whole Republican platform, and of course they're running on a don't raise taxes on anybody platform, if we implemented everything the Republicans are talking about, taxes would go up for about 55 to 60 million Americans. That's because no one's talking about the tax cuts that were part of the stimulus bill that we passed uh, in 2009. That reduced taxes for a couple for $800 in 2009, $800 in 2010, and it expires at the end of this year. So everybody's taxes is going, are going up. We're fighting about one half of 1%, maybe 1% of the taxpayers out there. That's what all the fireworks are about. If you watched uh, Fox News, you would think that was the only issue. But for half of Americans, the Obama tax cuts are more significant than the Bush tax cuts. And many of your viewers are going to think, when I say Obama tax cuts, that's the Obama position on the Bush tax cuts. No, I'm talking about the tax cuts that were signed into law by Obama early in his term. So let's get beyond what have been the talking points from Democrats and Republicans and ask mm -hmm. you at the end of the day, will there be an agreement between this White House and Republicans? And what would that agreement look like? I frankly have no idea whether there will be an agreement. Um, the, uh, there are so many ways to play it. You can draw the line at a million dollars. Uh, what we've seen in the past is total dysfunction and nothing being passed. That's what we've seen with the estate tax law, where uh, now very few Americans are subject to the estate tax law, and I guess in theory all of them are dead. But um, for uh, estates of people who died January 1st of this year, neither we don't know what the law is. Those estates still have to be kept open. Um, so we absolutely had to pass an estate tax law by January 1st, 2010. It'll be Christmas, and we probably still won't pass one. Could you see a proposal that would basically kick the can down the road by two years, saying we'll keep the Bush tax cuts across the board and deal with them in 2013? I don't think Democrats are going to um, treat those under 250 and those over 250, where maybe we'll draw the line at half a million or even a million, the same way. The, he, the key issue that will divide the parties is coupling. The Republicans will say, we want to hold the middle class hostage. The middle class will not get anything that the very richest don't receive. And Democrats will try to, uh, uh, to break that linkage. You have written uh, this to your constituents, the good, the bad, and the ugly dealing with the economy. And the good, you say, has been the Federal Reserve going about buying $600 billion worth of long-term bonds, and yet a lot of criticism that the President received when he was in Asia from Angela Merkel of Germany and uh, David Cameron of Great Britain and others saying that this is bad economic policy. Well, those countries that run enormous trade surpluses that, uh, that in effect take American manufacturing jobs have been very critical of Bernanke's policy, which is just more, one more reason to be in favor of it. When China says, this is unfair currency manipulation, um, uh, it's, it's more than laughable. Um, but the main reason for the policy is not to give us some fighting edge against the unfair trade policies of, of others, but rather uh, to try to get the economy moving in a way that doesn't increase the national debt and which does not permanently increase the, uh, the monetary supply, uh, the money supply. Um, what you should look for in a recession like this are policies that can get the economy moving that are reversible. And this is an ultimately uh, reversible policy. You can buy these bonds now, get the economy moving, and then when we have to worry about inflation, and I look forward to the day when we have to worry about it, uh, you can uh, sell these bonds and reduce the, the, uh, the money supply. And in the category of the bad, you talk about the Erskine Bowles, Allen Simpson Commission recommendations. We don't have the specifics yet. Mm -hmm. We'll get a sneak preview later today. The White House will get the document tomorrow. But you say that this plan is unworkable. Why? Well, there are really two plans. There's what the two chairmen released earlier, and then we'll see whether the commission is able to release a plan with uh, 14 
uh, affirmative votes um, uh, today, I guess. And just to clarify, it's 14 of 18 commission mm -hmm. members. 14 need to be in agreement to whatever they put right. forth. And, but the, the chairman's proposal, among other things on taxation, they, I mean, every, I wanted to, to endorse the proposal. Here was the commission that was going to give us shared sacrifice, austerity, and a road to a balanced budget. And instead, they've got huge tax giveaways uh, to corporations. And look, I'd like to reduce corporate taxes. I'd like to reduce individual taxes at the high end. But to say we're going to hit the middle class so hard that we're going to get a reputation for austerity and then sneak in provisions that don't provide austerity for corporations, but rather massive reductions in their taxes. And what, one thing they snuck in there, uh, they use code words, they call it a territorial approach to business taxation. They want to go to the absolute maximum in terms of tax incentives to offshore jobs. That is to say, if a U.S. company shuts down a factory and moves it abroad, that they will never pay taxes on the profit of their foreign-based factory. Never. So here you have what everybody wants to, I mean, the, the sensible thing. You have this deficit commission. Every, you know, pe people that want to reduce the deficit should all endorse it. But if you actually read it and get past the word austerity and see what's inside it, it's austerity for the middle class and incentives for offshoring American jobs. In advance of today's meeting with the White House, the President yesterday calling for a two-year freeze for an estimated two million federal employees for 2011-2012 mm -hmm. that could save about two billion dollars in the next couple of years, as much as five billion dollars in the next five years. Good idea, bad idea? I think it's an idea we, we need to look at. We in Congress have frozen our own pay and will probably continue to do so and probably should. Um, you, you hate to, uh, to turn to, to, to uh, to, to people that, that we all rely on uh, and, uh, and take away a cost of living increase. And at the same time, uh, inflation has been rather modest. There is testimony, uh, the Greenspan used to testify before us, that uh, the uh, actual inflation rate is really three-quarters of a percent less than the calculated inflation rate. So uh, if it was part of austerity across the board, shared sacrifice, then I think federal employees ought to be included. Why not reduce the number of federal employees? We have actually reduced the number of federal employees over the last 10 or 15 years a at a time when our population has grown and uh, at a time when our security needs uh, have uh, dramatically increased. Uh, I I'm referring to non-uniformed, obviously our military has increased uh, somewhat. Congressman Steny Hoyer had said that uh, uniformed uh, military personnel should also deal with the same pay freeze. During a war, that's, that's very difficult, uh, and wh whether there is anyone, uh, some subset of that that would be included, I, I would think not. I don't think we're going to see a freeze of our uniform military. Our conversation with uh, Representative Brad Sherman from California's 27th Congressional District, a Democrat member of the House Financial Services Committee. We're talking about the lame duck session. We'll also touch on the START Treaty and the WikiLeaks investigation. But first, Zella, joining us on the Democrats line from Bowie, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. I, have, I, I was thinking, the thing is, they haven't had an increase in almost two years now. Um, the federal employees that have called in, the majority of them agree with the pay freeze for two years. However, John Boehner, uh, soon to be Speaker of the House, he's gonna get a $30,000 increase. Also, the Republicans are pushing for the Bush tax Bush tax cut to stay in place for those millionaires, the people that have all the money. Now, President Bush, he gave us two tax cuts in the um, stimulus plan, and that was fine. That was great. The so-called Bush tax cuts for the middle class, that really amounted to nothing, maybe, what, $100 a month? So, and we're going to pay $700 billion to continue those tax cuts for the wealthy, who on average, their increase under Bush tax cuts was more than $53,000 a year. So, uh, I mean, a lot of middle class people aren't even making $53,000 a year. So now it's just not fair. And the Republicans have just duped all these people that voted for them to be in office. And this um, new representative from Eastern Shore, Maryland, the first thing he says when he gets in the office is, when, do my, when does my health care benefits kick in, my government-run health care plan? But yet he ran against 
Obamacare. Thank it's you. just ridiculous. Thanks, Zella. Yeah, if I could comment on some of that, uh, I think uh, the caller uh, maybe said Bush when she meant Obama. The stimulus bill contained tax cuts that are more important for half of Americans uh, than the Bush tax cuts. Uh, chief amongst these are the $800 uh, per family, $400 for single people, tax cuts for working families. Uh, and those tax cuts expire at uh, the end of this year. Uh, when you look at um, a plan to balance the budget, we ought to have liberal policies now, that is to say expand the money supply, expand demand over the next two years, and at the same time a longer term plan uh, to reduce the deficit. Uh, I uh, generally agree with the caller. One, one other thing I want to point out is not all taxes on business have the same effect on business uh, productivity and business employment. Uh, a corporate income tax should, in theory, not affect the corporation's behavior at all uh, because the corporation wants to make as much money as it can, whether it has to give a quarter or a third of that money to the federal government, they're keeping three quarters or they're keeping two thirds. Uh, in contrast, if you have a, a, a tax on, say, uh, exports, uh, that would dramatically affect uh, our, um, uh, our, our corporate behavior. So uh, Republicans, um, like to kind of confuse things and say any tax on business will dramatically affect business behavior. Some do, some don't. You need to look at the tax policy of the individual tax. Congressman Sherman, who also serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Judiciary Committee, let me get your reaction to the comments uh, this morning from John Boehner, the incoming Speaker of the House in the next Congress, and Republican Leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell. They wrote it in the Washington Post this morning. Quote, while Americans have been asking for where the jobs are for more than two years, our friends across the aisle have been clung too long to a liberal wish list, including a job-killing health care law, a cap-and-trade national energy tax, and an out-of-control spending spree. The November elections, they write, represented a wholesale rejection of these policies. They go on to say the time is running out. This Friday, funding for the government runs out, and at the end of December, Every single taxpayer will get hit with one of the largest tax hikes in American history. Well, what's interesting is those Republican leaders are interested only or primarily in those at the very top end of the scale. Under their plan, the taxes would go up. If we did everything Boehner wanted, everything McConnell wanted, taxes would go up for the vast majority, well, for the majority of Americans. They don't focus on the tax cut of $800 for every family because their focus is on who they can give an $80,000 or an $800,000 tax cut at the top end. Uh, for them to write that taxes shouldn't go up at the end of the year while they're endorsing a program to raise taxes on the majority of Americans uh, shows that they don't focus on tax cuts that affect those uh, uh, who are working families. Derek is joining us from Baltimore, Maryland, with mm -hmm. Brad Sherman, Congressman from California. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fine, Just fine. Uh, guys, my um, comment, I guess, is um, I, you know, I'm 31, and I'm, I'm unmarried with any no kids. Um, I don't know if I will do that. Uh, you know, part because I always ponder what our country will be like in the next, you know, 20 years or so. Um, people talk about the jobs that are gone to other uh, countries. You know, uh, we don't really want those jobs. You know, a lot of those jobs are um, technologies that we've. Uh, I'm saying we as Americans, we've um, we've mastered, and you know, that we've had them for 40, 50 years. You know, the textile industry um, in the South, and um, even even um, you know the lower tech automobiles. You know, just regular gasoline engines. You know, we've been doing that since um, the Model T. We need new technologies. You know, I, I, uh, I, I just hope that our focus will be on um, honing these new technologies, especially um, uh, the energy technologies. You know, there's no reason why um, a solar panel shouldn't be on every roof in the, in the country. You know, we need to change the whole way we use um, energy, and that's part of the bigger uh, thing of security. You know, we talk about our military security uh, all the time, but our economic security is at stake if we don't, um, you know, get off of these old arguments about the textile industry and the auto industry. We need new 
uh, innovative industries. Thanks, Gary. I, uh, I think in the long term, the caller might be right, but in the, the, the situation today is we need jobs, and we need jobs in the textile industry and the auto industry. Um, I, I don't think uh, that we've uh, reached a point uh, where we could give up all the jobs uh, that existed in the, uh, in the industries of 20, 30, and 40 years ago and employ all Americans uh, in technologies that are invented uh, this century. And the fact is, Americans do want jobs if those jobs pay well. Uh, there are a lot of jobs in, in construction uh, that are some of the most difficult and sometimes dangerous jobs. And there's a long line of people who want them because they pay $30, $40 an hour. Uh, there are lots of people who want unionized uh, automobile jobs. Uh, we need to create a circumstance, though, where we can export. And what we've seen from our trading partners, most notably China, is that they flood us with their exports and they uh, act to prohibit our exports uh, to their country. China is uh, the best example. Uh, they cl have free access to our markets. Then when we try to sell them airplanes, they say we won't buy the airplanes from the United States unless America builds an airplane factory in our country. So uh, we're in a circumstance where the only way to get exports is to export jobs. China does that to us and we don't comment because Wall Street sees that as profitable. Wall Street sees that the real way to make money is to sell things for dollars but pay the workers pennies and the way to do that is to make it in China and other low-cost countries. So you have um, a, uh, uh, a, a constant discussion of how um, uh, we need to keep going with the current trade policies. If we don't change our trade policies, um, we're, we're going to see another collapse uh, that's going to be greater than the one we faced in 2008. A couple of quick points. Let me yeah. remind our audience, especially if you're listening on C-SPAN Radio, our conversation with Congressman Brad Sherman, Democrat from California's 27th Congressional District. Kathleen says jobs are being outsourced and will end only when we make it more expensive to bring products into this country. All countries do it, she says, tariffs. We ought to have tariffs that match the tariff barriers and the non-tariff barriers that other countries have. China is a, is, a, is a great example here. You see, when we gave them most favored nation status, they changed their written laws and written tariffs, and we changed our written laws and written tariffs. The thing is, in China, businesses and consumers don't just have to obey the written laws. What matters in China is the unwritten, and all the unwritten laws in China are don't buy American. So when one of their airlines wants American planes, they're told don't buy it unless the fuselages are made in China. Not only the fuselages for the Chinese used planes, but worldwide. When uh, equipment is needed, their companies are told buy the German equipment, not the American equipment. Why? Because Germany is smart enough to demand fair trade with China. And we are suckers to our own belief that all countries are just like ours that if China changes its law, that we've accomplished something major. China is not a country where the written law controls people's behavior. But a follow-up again on our Twitter page as the conversation mm -hmm. continues, a viewer saying, fact is we can only tell, that we cannot tell China anything. They are holding the purse strings. They own us now. Hardly. You see, in our day-to-day -day life, the debtor is weaker than the creditor. If I don't pay my bank, they take my house. In international finance, especially sovereign government finance, the debtor is more powerful than the creditor. If we don't pay China, what do they do? They can't kick us out of their house. So the fact is, often, uh, it is the, 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 de the creditor that has to beg the debtor to actually pay. Um, but the fact is, we have the most valuable thing. We have the market. China is dependent upon that market, and our market shouldn't be open to them unless their market is really open to us. And that's not the case. They have a controlled economy. They have uh, 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 fooled us. I think we wanted to be fooled because Washington and Wall Street sees huge profits uh, from this offshoring and uh, uh, tells people, oh, we have, you know, this is a fair trade agreement. It's a fair trade agreement if China had the same respect for law the same independence of countries, the same kind of capitalism we do, and of course they don't. The President proposes it's up to Congress to dispose on the issue of the pay freeze for federal employees. Will you vote for it? 
or against it? I will certainly take a look at it. I'm leaning uh, in, to, uh, to vote for it, but I'd want to see it as part of an overall package. If we're going to give huge tax cuts to the very wealthy and then tax freezes for working uh, uh, people who work for the federal government, I'd be a little less inclined to, to go along with it. Well, that's Peter's point from Ellicott City, Maryland. He sent us this email to ask federal employees to take a pay cut while extending the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy is ludicrous. Um, I tend to agree. Will there be a vote in this Congress? Will it come up next year? My guess is that the pay freeze will come up next year. Various tax proposals will come up for a vote in this Congress, but whether any of them will be adopted into law, I don't know. Cameron joining us, Republican line up mm -hmm. early in Seattle, Washington, with Congressman Sherman of California. Good morning. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. You know, I wanted to just uh, comment. I, I, I got on almost two years ago to the day, um, Congressman, when you were on at the end of the segment, all as a moderator. Henry Paulson, if you remember at the time, being awarded um, the keys to the kingdom, and uh, how I and you didn't. And as a result, in retrospect, what happened? Uh, you know, they they allowed Goldman Sachs to be rated as a bank instead of putting back in the the gold type legislation that separated banks from from Wall Street. They they continued it further, and now the banks are part of Wall or Wall Street's part of the banking system. And um, what, what did they do for it? Who was Lehman? Who was Goldman Sachs' um, competitor? Cameron, I'm going to jump yeah. in because the connection is not real clear, but did yeah. you get enough? I'm missing some of the words. First, I think our viewer watches an awful lot of C-SPAN, remembers that I was on a couple of years ago. Your other viewers may not remember that I was here opposing the TARP bailout. Now, the uh, TARP bailout that was proposed by, uh, by Hank Paulson, he said he was going to buy troubled assets. That's why we call it uh, the uh, Troubled Asset uh, uh, Program, which is the first two letters of TARP. Uh, ultimately, he went out and bought preferred stock. He had testified before us that he wouldn't. And so he ended up adopting a better plan than the one he testified that he would use. But the fact is, TARP was a, a, a break of the, um, of the social contract that we have in this country and was the uh, uh, adoption of a policy that there are some on Wall Street too big to fail some too well connected to fail, and that's why uh, I voted against uh, the Washington, the uh, the Wall Street bailout, and would again. The new bill that we passed, I think, on balance, diminishes the power of the executive branch to bail out Wall Street. Um, it doesn't eliminate it, but it moves in that direction. It pairs back some of the devices that were used alongside TARP to bail out Wall Street, and um, it uh, uh, I think reduces the likelihood. That, uh, that we'll ever see bailouts in the future. Most important is an amendment um, that authorizes the, uh, the regulators to break up any entity that's too big to fail. If they use that power, we'll never again see too big to fail, we'll never again be held hostage by a company that took enormous risks for their own profit and then says, we got to bail them out or they'll take us with them. So how well that bill works depends a lot on the regulators. But if we can break up those institutions that are over $100 billion or $150 billion in size, we can protect us from the situation we faced in 2008 where people, where people on Wall Street would say, you can't let us go down, we'll drag you with us. We're dealing with a number of issues that will be debated and uh, some voted upon during the lame duck session. When do you think the House will wrap up business? I, uh, my, my guess is always right at the beginning of school Christmas vacation um, uh, or winter vacation, uh, probably uh, uh, a, you know, about the 17th of, uh, of December. And we have a Twitter question that also came up earlier this morning on the pay freeze for federal employees. This viewer is saying that I thought government employees were unionized. How is it that Obama is able to cut their pay? Obviously, Congress needs to vote on this. The federal government employees are, are not as robust as those in, uh, in state government. Um, again, I'll have to look at um, the, uh, the situation, but there is not you know, for, uh, the, the same kind of protection um, and the same uh, right to strike that you find in, in state and local government. Uh, Bill is joining us, Democrats Line from Sheffield, Ohio, with Congressman Sherman. Good morning. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, and thank you very much for allowing the average citizen to voice their opinion. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of short comments. The first one is I keep hearing equal sacrifice, and I agree with that. But what bothers me is every Republican plan I, I hear or see 
involves sacrifice by average Americans and poor Americans and no sacrifice by the wealthy. Why aren't the wealthy sacrificing like everyone else? The second comment I'd like to make as well as actually more a suggestion is, why not let the tax cuts expire for the very wealthy, okay, and use that money and give it to the poor and middle class for a bigger tax cut? This would not only help the people who need help the most, it would help our, our economy because these people would go out and spend that money and create jobs. Thank you very much for listening to my comments. Thank you. Uh, first, I will give the Republicans their due. They're always saying this isn't a tax cut, um, it's, but it is an extension of temporary tax cuts. And I couldn't agree uh, with uh, the caller more. Uh, when you look at the uh, Bull Simpson plan produced by the two chairmen of that deficit commission, they involve huge tax uh, cut. Uh, you have huge tax increases for the middle class, massive uh, Social Security uh, uh, benefit cuts and other things, that really wallop the middle class. And then, because the middle class is so uh, shocked by this austerity, they're able to sneak in without much comment in the press a one-quarter reduction in corporate income tax rates, a complete elimination of the taxation of those engaged in offshoring, maximizing the tax benefit for offshoring jobs, and a 12 percent cut in the taxes faced uh, by those at the high end. Um, when you see the Republican plan today, their focus is on spending $700 billion to provide tax cuts for the upper one, one and a half percent. And at the same time, the Republican plan, and unfortunately the Democratic plan, is to allow to expire the uh, $800 per family tax cut that covered 2009 and 2010. To be fiscally responsible, I'd like to see well-crafted tax cuts for 2011, maybe 2012. We then have to go, when the economy recovers, to an austerity plan, and we need to put it in place now so it takes effect when the unemployment rate is reduced, and so that we can tell um, investors around the world that we have a plan to deal with our long-term deficit, and that that plan will go into effect when the unemployment rate drops below 6 or below 5%. The other story that you and other members of Congress will certainly be talking about uh, this week, the headline of the Washington mm -hmm. Post, the U.S. downplaying the impact of the WikiLeaks. It is an issue that came up yesterday at the White House briefing because we heard from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. We heard from Eric Holder. We heard from Ambassador Susan Rice. But the president did not speak publicly about the uh, WikiLeaks release and its impact on American foreign policy and military operations, most notably in Iraq and Afghanistan. Here's the exchange yesterday from the White House briefing room with Press Secretary Robert Gibbs. Robert, you said earlier that uh, you have to balance the need to know and the need to share, and you talked about after 9-11, part of the, one of the big problems was there wasn't enough sharing of information, and also that troops in the field need all the information that they can get. Are you suggesting that in a free society, if you have a bad actor someplace, uh, perhaps a threat from Manning, but that these things are simply going to happen, and uh, you, you simply can't stop it from well, happening? Well, no. I I, I think t two things, Chip. First of all, obviously, um, uh, there, regardless of the walls that you set up, uh, there are certainly going to be occasions in which people do not take their oath to their country seriously uh, about protecting uh, the access that they have or the information that they're given that is either sensitive or highly classified. Um, I think that's been true for the history of our country. Um, what the responsibility that our administration and every administration has, though, is to ensure that legitimate safeguards are put in place in order to ensure that the access that is provided is warranted based on uh, your ability to get that information. And what's your ability to take uh, that information off of off of a website and copy it, or copy it thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of times. So, Congressman Sherman, that was really mm -hmm. the essence of uh, the discussion at the White House and on Capitol Hill. Did the administration try to downplay this, and have they succeeded? Um, of course they're going to try to downplay it. Um, they have not succeeded, and yet uh, what they've succeeded in is, is making this more of a 95 rather than a 100. And uh, only time will tell, but it's it's a it's a very important uh, 
uh, development, and it's not uh, it's it's part of a series. We saw the releases in July, October, and now late November, and um, this is going to hurt us in a number of ways. Uh, first, it's going to uh, the the content itself is is going to embarrass us and provide our enemies with uh, insights as to how we operate. Then, in terms of confidentiality, who's going to trust us with a secret in the future? Uh, who's going to say anything to us that they don't want to see in the New York Times or the uh, Manchester Guardian? And uh, also, it's going to f make more communication more difficult within um, our government. Right now, uh, you email anything to everybody and you expect it's top secret. Well, top secret means could be on the front page. Then finally, our international image. We're viewed as the world's only superpower. This makes us look like a, a superpower that can't shoot straight. Uh, I was also interested in, in, in Peter's comment. Peter Hofstra was uh, on right before me as uh, uh, the ranking member of the Intelligence uh, Committee, and he points out you've got uh, perhaps three million people with a security clearance that allows them to peruse these documents. Um, and yet when Congress asks for classified briefings, they're often not told some of the information that's on WikiLeaks now. So you have an executive branch that, that shares information way too broadly inside the executive branch and not with Congress. The other thing is we, you know, we, we noticed that the intelligence community had too much sto uh, uh, stove piping where they weren't sharing information from agency to agency. They went way overboard and now you have a private first class with, in, with not just the information they need with regard to their own company, but rather um, uh, downloading hundreds of thousands of documents. And the one thing that makes this different from even 10 years ago, you know, if we had, if we had, had five Russian spies go into the CIA in the 1960s and let them rummage around the files, they might not find anything interesting. There's a lot of files. But now you can have a PFC who doesn't just rum, who in rummaging around is able to walk out of the building with a quarter million documents. And most of them are boring, most of them are irrelevant, most of them won't hurt us. But with a quarter million documents, um, there's, uh, there's a lot in there that is going to hurt us, hurt our image, uh, hurt our ability to communicate inside the government, and uh, embarrass uh, us with the individual content of individual documents. Tiffany joining us with, uh, from Austin, Texas with Congressman Brad Sherman. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I had a quick little point uh, going back to the tax cut. Sorry to change the subject again. That's okay. We're okay. dealing with all yep. kinds of issues, so <laughs> go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm curious as to why the Democrats haven't in so many ways kind of learned the lesson of the election with respect to the tax cut. If you want to make the point, which I think is a valid one, that the extension of the tax cut does exactly what Republicans ran against, which is contribute to the deficit. And two, it doesn't do anything that I can tell or that I've read to actually contribute to the revving of our economy, which should be a priority. How are the Democrats going to find a way to make those points? Because you mentioned the press, but the truth of the matter is it's, it's your responsibility because the press, for better or for worse, you know, they're kind of wrapped up in this WikiLeaks thing. So what, what's the plan? Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, as far as getting the message out, people in my own area in the San Fernando Valley can took a, take a look at uh, last Friday's Daily News, uh, where I've uh, uh, got my, uh, uh, my column making some of the points that I'm making here. The fact is that um, any time the government forgoes taxes or spends money, it has some stimulus effect, which is something we need now. Some of it is more bang for the buck. Some of it is less bang for the buck. And any time we do anything to deal with the deficit, if we do it now, that reduces economic activity now. So in general, what we need is efficient and reversible ways to pump up the economy now together with a plan for austerity and pulling money out of the economy uh, in order to, uh, to pay for the entitlements uh, that are uh, just around the corner. What we, in fact, though, both parties are, are, are just fighting the battles that they tend to fight and not looking at each proposal to say how much stimulus are we getting versus how much is it increasing the deficit? What is the plan that we can show investors today that will go into effect when the unemployment rate goes down so that they have some belief that we'll be able to pay our debts in the future? Um, the fights tend to be on a few hot-button issues 
and those dominate the press. And the one issue that's dominating the press now is the upper part of the Bush tax cuts. And as I've tried to point out uh, here today with Steve, nobody's talking about something that's even more important to uh, most American families, and that's the, uh, that's the Obama tax cuts, the $800 that went into effect for 2009 and 2010. Brad Sherman represents California's 27th Congressional District among his committee assignments, Financial Services, Foreign Affairs, and House Judiciary Committee. Just re-elected, he represents the Sherman Oaks, California area. Next is a viewer from Citrus, Citrus Heights, California, on the Republican line. Good morning, Randy. Hey, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, in response to that woman who called earlier and said that uh, she was scoffing at the $100 uh, amount of some Bush tax, tax cut or something, $100 a month, and I'm thinking, wow, that's my cable bill. I'm thinking of, speaking of cable, thank you for C-SPAN. Congressman, my question to you this morning is, it, which camp are you in? I'm seeing Democrats after this election, some of them, a lot of whom lost, are being pretty honest about it and saying, you know, they just rejected our agenda, they rejected the way that we pushed the health care bill through you know, something of that size and scope shouldn't have been passed on a party line vote. And it was just an abuse of power and people really got energized and I'm still I'm still really energized. And then you have the other camp who was like, Oh, it was the messaging and we didn't do enough and it was all about jobs and I d I, I don't disagree that the economy contributed to the loss, but it wasn't e everything that it was all about. And uh, so I'm just wondering, which, which camp are you in, and are the Democrats ready to actually, you know, get something done here in the future? Because, frankly, the people that I see remaining behind seem to be the ones with the blinders on and just want to continue following Nancy Pelosi. And I don't know what you think that's going to get you. Thanks, Randy. We'll get a response. Appreciate the call. Uh, I may not be in the camp you want me to be, and I don't think I'm entirely in any camp, but when you look at the health care bill, uh, Obama ran on the health care bill. People who voted for Obama who didn't know he was going to push a health care bill fairly similar to what was adopted or even more offensive to Republicans, he wanted a public option, as did I, uh, weren't paying attention. And the country voted overwhelmingly for uh, an Obama presidency, knowing that the one thing he had campaigned about clear back in Iowa was the health care bill. I don't think people uh, then, two years later, decided they hated the health care bill. What they decided they hated was the economic result of 9.6 percent unemployment. We lost this election when, uh, early in the administration, some of the economic advisors said, if the stimulus bill is passed, uh, unemployment will stay under 8 percent. That was, this, that was political malpractice to make that statement. It turned out to be economic malpractice as well. Uh, I voted for the stimulus bill, but I never thought it would keep the unemployment rate under 8%. And uh, when you set the bar for yourself at 8% and the unemployment rate is 9.6%, then you failed uh, to, uh, to clear your own bar. Uh, when uh, we talked about a recovery summer, that wasn't happening. Um, this, uh, the president talks about uh, the car being driven uh, into a ditch and we shouldn't give the keys back to the people who uh, uh, drove it into the ditch. The fact is, if a car is driven into a ditch and you can't get the car out of the ditch in 18 months, there's something the matter with you. The car wasn't drove, driven, though, into a ditch. That was the mistake. The car was driven over the cliff and down into the Grand Canyon. And we've been trying to drag it up from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. If the president had told people at the beginning of administration that we were in free fall, uh, that it was going to take years, that we, uh, that we, we were going to face the economic problems that we indeed faced, the country would more, be more forgiving of where we are now. But when a picture was painted that, well, it's just a car in a ditch, we'll get it out, unemployment will stay under 8%, and none of that, uh, none of that's true. Um, then people didn't compare us to the Republicans. They compared us to the standards uh, that uh, the president's economic advisors had set, and by those standards, we failed. Our last call is from Federal Way, Washington. Sherman is on the phone. Democrats line. Good morning. Good morning, uh, 
I have a question. Uh, what good uh, do the too big to fail and uh, the the corporate structure? Uh, what do, what good are they presently doing for the American people? The uh, bankers are all hoarding the money. Uh, the corporations are all, uh, uh, you know, they're they're not a, they're not they have no alliance to the American worker, and uh, they they they're, they're uh, hiring people overseas. What good? What, why should the people of America support the corporate structure? You know, I, uh, I, I, I think the corporate structure is in for a lot of trouble. Um, I uh, tend to agree with you, but I put the blame on Washington as much or more than Wall Street because the business community is, that, is I mean, they often lobby for very bad policies, but they respond in a logical way to the laws we provide. Too big to fail should be too big to exist. Uh, I fought for a bill that, and have co-sponsored a bill, that would just draw a line so you can't be any bigger than that. If you are, split yourself into two. Protozo are able to do that. I think our big banks uh, can as well. Instead, we have allowed, here in Washington, we've allowed um, entities to get so big that they're able to threaten the entire economy and demand bailouts. Uh, as to hoarding money, um, I think that uh, there is some of that, but the, uh, the corporate community uh, isn't investing in new plant and equipment because there isn't the demand for the product. The reason the local coffee shop in, in my district doesn't hire another waitress is because the tables are empty. And then finally, as to offshoring jobs, yes, the corporate community is doing that, and they're doing it because we in Washington uh, have created a, 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 a basis, uh, a, a system in which that's profitable. And of course, Wall Street has, has, has lobbied for that and, uh, and lobbied effectively. And that's why we have an enormous trade deficit. We lose uh, w millions of jobs, well over a million jobs uh, as a result. And um, uh, we are constantly told, oh, fair, you know, free trade is wonderful, without examining the fact that what we have now is, a, is a, a cancerous version of free trade, not real free trade. Final question. Uh, more than 60 Democrats will be leaving the House of Representatives mm -hmm. this year. You'll have a new speaker starting in January. What will the tone be of the 112th Congress? I'm afraid that Washington is dysfunctional chiefly because of the filibuster. Um, in also in the Senate. In the Senate. That uh, in the House, I think that the Republicans will pass uh, most of their agenda. Um, but what we don't see is a pressure to compromise. Um, and we have a primary system in most states. My state has moved in another direction um, where it's hard to win a Republican primary if you've compromised with Democrats. Look what happened to Mike Castle in Delaware. So uh, I don't think that we're going to see the kind of compromises that we need. And often we need this super compromise to overcome a filibuster. So um, I, uh, I, I would not be surprised if we go right up to the precipice of either defaulting on our debt or shutting down uh, huge chunks of the federal government uh, sometime in the next year. You think that could happen? I think we'll go to the precipice. I don't know if we'll go out over, but uh, you'll see headlines. Uh, WikiLeaks won't be in the headlines forever. You'll see headlines, government shutdown threatened um, within the next uh, 12 months. Well, you'll be back in the ne next Congress, and we'll have you come back and uh, check in on these issues. Look forward to being here. Congressman Brad Sherman, Democrat from California's 27th Congressional District. Thank you very much.